Well, Faith herself says that it took her years to catch up and learn the basics. But with her determination and with the really committed support of her teachers, um, she finally left the Young Parents College after about three years with a scholarship and she entered Canterbury University. This is a true story, and Faith is her real name, and the information I'm sharing with you is on her University of Canterbury profile. And I have her permission, of course, to share it with you. Um, she de decided to return to school and to study at university because she wanted a better future for her own children. She said, it's taken a lot of hard work and dedication and support for me to catch up socially and academically in order to attend university. She's now had a second child. She's completed her Bachelor of Commerce. She's completed her Honours degree by studying part-time. As a top student in her Honours year, Faith started the final stage of her long-term academic goal, which is to do a PhD in business management. Far from having difficulty sitting at a desk all day, Faith tells me that she now puts in a 40-hour week of study, in addition to her commitments as a busy parent of two young children. Is this a story of personal tragedy? resulting from becoming a parent as a teenager. In fact, I think you'd probably agree that it's quite the opposite. It was actually Faith's pregnancy and parenthood that were a turning point in her life. And these, this turning point caused her to come to a school for teenage parents in her quest to be a good mother. And this set her on a pathway of exceptional academic achievement, a pathway that may not otherwise have been realised. We will never know, of course, but for her, becoming a, a young parent was certainly a turning point in her life. Recently, I was interviewed on TV One's breakfast show about my research, and Tony Street asked me, rather confrontationally, if I was, she's also a graduate of Canterbury University, I see, uh, she asked me if, in fact, I was advocating that young women should have babies in their teens. And I replied that, of course, this is not what I'm saying, and interestingly, neither is it the position of, of um, the young women that I interviewed in my research. However, teenage parenthood is a reality for many young women in New Zealand. In the year to September 2012, 3,886 babies were born to New Zealand teens. And this poses a challenge to our communities. Rather than vilifying young parents as irresponsible, as too young to be fit parents, which are the kind of labels that they are accused of, um, what can we do to best support them and their children? In this presentation, I'm going to offer some answers to this question. Along the way, I'm going to share with you a number of stories partly because my research drew on life stories, and also because personal stories about real people are engaging. They offer a human face to the often depressing statistics and negative stereotypes uh, about socially marginalised groups of people such as teenage parents. I'm going to tell you the stories of Andy and Kate, and Andy and Kate are not the names of um, these two young women. Um, they were two of my research participants. Um, and I'm going to include in those stories the transforming effect on their lives of teenage parenthood and of their attendance at a school for teenage parents. These stories are characteristic of many young women who become parents in their teenage years. I'm also going to discuss with you what it was about um, a school such as the, or what it is about a school such as the one in my study that enabled it to play such a positive role in supporting these young women to discover and fulfill their innate potential as young women, as mothers, 
and as learners. But first, I would like to return to the question that I posed before. How can we best support young and often vulnerable families such as those of teenage parents? Now, it was my own attempt to answer this question that led to my work with teenage parents and to the setting up of a teen parent school. So it all began back in the 1990s when I was employed by a community trust, a very forward-looking community trust, to uh, work with teenage parents in Canterbury, um, mostly teenage mumps and some teenage dads. Um, and after a year or so of, of working with these young people, two of the young mums came to me and said that they wanted to get their school certificate. Back in the 90s it was still school certificate, now it's NCEA Level 1. Um, so these two young women wanted to study by correspondence, but they were quite frightened um, and they asked for me to assist them with their studies. And as a former secondary school teacher, of course, I was really excited at that prospect. So I invited them to come to my little office and we set up a study group and away we went. And interestingly, several other young women that I was working with also expressed their interest in, in trying the same thing and doing school certificate. So this was really the beginnings of our little school back in the 90s. And uh, we hired a church hall and we got some trestle tables and we got some toys for the children. And um, we started studying and, and it was kind of happy chaos really because we had babies and little children kind of crawling around the floor under the trestle tables around our feet while we were studying. So that was, that was the beginning of, of it all. And all, interestingly, all of these young women had dropped out of high school with few, if any, qualifications. In fact, I, I don't think that any of those young women had any school qualifications at all. But I was really overwhelmed with their motivation to re-engage with education for the sake of their children. To cut a long story short, Karanga My Young Parents College, which was the second school for teenage parents in New Zealand, was born with a great deal of support from a lot of people, from individuals, from community groups, even government agencies. And interestingly, in the following years, other small schools began to spring up quite independently in the North Island of New Zealand. So it was obviously a, a concept that, whose time was right. And um, in the following years, as these schools sprang up, we, um, we, we got together and we began negotiating and struggling with the Ministry of Education. And we succeeded, by 2004 we had succeeded in securing appropriate funding and official recognition from the Ministry of Education. And today, New Zealand has 20 teen parent units, as they're now called, and in fact, next week, I'm off to Auckland to address a public meeting about the setting up of the 21st Teen Parent Unit, which is going to be on the North Shore of Auckland. Each of these schools, um, or units, has an attached early childhood centre for the children of the young parents. Each provides transport to and from the school, and each provides healthy food. The units also offer wraparound support to their students with the many needs and challenges that they face as young people and as young parents. So these are not just schools which are focused on academic learning. They offer wraparound support. And this sort of support comes in the form of counselling, of um, budgeting advice, of um, housing advocacy, and as you can imagine, in Christchurch at the moment, that's a significant need for teenage parents because um, rental um, accommodation is so expensive and so short, uh, so unavailable, so this is a particular need here in Christchurch. Um, these schools offer legal advocacy. They bring in plunket services and parenting support. Um, they offer health advice and guidance, and um, you know that might be for any range of issues, mental health issues, physical health issues, drug and alcohol counselling, and so on. And um, it's interesting, in my research, I studied a number of educational initiatives around the world um, uh, for teenage parents, particularly in the United States and in Great Britain. And 
I can confidently say that on the world stage, um, these teen parent schools or teen parent units are an innovative and highly successful response to the educational and other needs of teenage parents. Several years ago, um, when I was um, studying here at, at, um, in the early stages of my degree, um, Emeritus Professor of Education Bridget Summock came to Canterbury University and she spent some months with us. And uh, she's an internationally renowned academic from the UK. And I took her with me to visit Karangamai Young Parents College because she expressed an interest in having a look at this, um, at this little school. And she expressed her amazement that such an establishment existed. And she observed that nothing of its kind or quality could be found in the United Kingdom. Now, before I um, share with you the stories of Andy and Kate, I'd like to just tell you a little bit more about my own research. When I retired from my role as director of Karangamai Young Parents College after 15 years, I decided to return to university and undertake doctoral research into teenage parenthood. And there were several reasons for this decision. In my work, I'd had the privilege of walking alongside many young women as they underwent the challenges and adjustments of becoming new parents and also of returning to school to gain qualifications which would improve their own and their children's lives. In this journey, I was to witness again and again the transformative effect of the school on the lives and identities of these young women and their children. I was interested to discover what it was about the culture and practices of teen parent schools which contributed to these positive changes in people's lives, especially since most of the young people who attended the schools and who attend the schools had hated secondary school, conventional secondary school. I was also motivated to share the stories of some of these young women often difficult and confronting stories, but also wonderful and uplifting stories, which are such a challenge to some of the negative social stereotypes about what we regard or what many people regard as the personal and social disaster of becoming a, a parent in your teens. So these stories confront um, those attitudes. And in this way, I felt that um, I could give voice to some real teenage mothers in the academic arena, because what I discovered was much of the research had been undertaken by academics, most of whom had never worked in the field of teenage, with, with teenage parents. And there certainly was a dearth of um, the real voices of young people talking about their own experience as teenage parents. So I felt that my research would offer a forum for that to take place. Now I'd, I'd like to share with you um, Andy's story. Andy is a real young woman. She's not a statistic. She's a unique, breathing, living human being, and she's one of approximately 4,000 teenage women who have babies in any given year in New Zealand. She's a young woman whose story is also representative in many ways of the stories and experiences of other teenage mums. So her story is universal as well as a particular story. Andy had quite a difficult childhood. Um, she had what she described as a sad and lonely childhood, which was really marked by quite s severe um, emotional and, and um, material privation. Um, her childhood was um, very affected by the fact that her father was in prison on and off throughout her childhood. And she um, described her mother as... as um, obviously highly stressed, emotionally rather unavailable. She had older siblings who were extremely difficult. So Andy had an, a f quite an isolated childhood. She um, didn't go to early childhood 
um, to Kindi, and um, she she felt that she was different from, she was really aware that her family was different from other families. And um, she was self-conscious about this difference. She became a, a well-guarded um, little girl. When she started at primary school, she said that she initially had the sense that she was quite bright. But gradually that kind of confidence in herself was eroded through particularly at intermediate school and by the time she got to high school she was completely turned off education and she was an angry and resistant young woman. She had given up trying because she was very afraid of failure and um, she had spent a lot of time truanting from school, um, challenging school rules um, and in the end she was stood down from school because she um, was involved in a violent exchange with a teacher. She, so she then dropped out of school, that was enough for her. She was 15, she had no qualifications, she had no work, she spent a lot of time hanging around, she said, drinking. She was quite depressed, had quite serious bouts of depression and by the time she was 16, she was pregnant. Um, about a year later, she started at a school for teenage parents. She enrolled at, the, at a school. And um, she came really primarily because she was feeling very lonely at home. Um, her teachers tell me that she was really volatile and resistant. So when she came to the teen parent school, she brought all of her behaviours that she had developed at, at high school straight into the teen parent school. She, her teachers worked really hard to uh, try and engage her and to encourage her to step out of her comfort zone and to give schoolwork a go. For months, she angrily refused to do anything. So not only schoolwork, but to engage in any activities at the school. So she was there, but she was not there. And other students also found her really unapproachable, and she was slow to make friends. After about four months, uh, when her teachers had almost given up hope of winning her confidence, her maths teacher managed to coax her into tackling a few simple unit standards, which of course, she achieved very easily. And this was her first taste of academic success in a very long time, probably since early um, in primary school. And it was to start her on a journey of personal and academic growth with surprising results, which I'll return to a bit later. Now I'll share with you some of Kate's story. Um, Unlike Kate, unlike Andy, Kate came from a, a privileged background, um, from a supportive family, of a professional family. But Kate's childhood was really marked by the fact that she had quite significant learning difficulties. And her learning difficulties were really inappropriately dealt with at her primary school and subsequently at her secondary school. Um, she had a sense that she was quite bright. She said, that she knew things, but she couldn't convince anyone else, certainly not her teachers, that she knew things, because she had great difficulty with written expression and some difficulty learning to read as well. So her experience of school was that although she tried really hard, nothing she ever did was good enough for her teachers. And um, over time, she became very frustrated, and she internalised her, her teacher's frustration with her as um, the fact that everyone hates me. That's how, that's how she interpreted their frustration and impatience with her learning difficulties. By the time she had reached secondary school, she had also given up. She was quite different from Andy. She wasn't an outwardly um, angry and aggressive young woman at all, um, but she was certainly switched off to education. She was also um, lacking in confidence socially and um, 
It was when she was 13 or 14 that she discovered something that in fact did give her some kudos in the eyes of other people, and this was drinking. So she discovered that she could drink quite heavily and um, still, I guess, remain standing. And this was quite impressive to her peers. So this was a kind of a conduit for her towards some form of social recognition and approval. Her uh, drinking led on to drug use and her drug use led on to addiction. And her addiction at around the age of 15 led on to um, having to sell drugs, to deal in drugs, because she couldn't afford to um, maintain her, her um, addiction. Um, this was all completely unbeknownst to her family. Um, somehow her, her parents managed to get her through NCEA Level 1, and which she actually passed. And then she dropped out of school, that was it for her. She said that she had very few hopes and aspirations for her own future. She um, formed a relationship fairly quickly with a young man who was a very difficult young man, a very violent young man, and she became pregnant also at 16. Um, she had mental health issues and she felt that she was a failure within her family because her family was a successful family and she felt like a failure. When she started at um, the School for Teenage Parents, she was a quietly spoken, nervous and very young looking pregnant teenager. She came to the school with a whole file of diagnostic testing which identified her learning uh, difficulties and the teachers at the school felt quite apprehensive about um, whether they were going to be able to respond to her specific learning um, needs because um, only one of them had any training in, in working with learning difficulties. So they were apprehensive about whether they were really going to be able to support her learning needs adequately. Soon after that, Kate um, had her baby and she returned to school when her little girl was just a few weeks old. For the first year that um, Kate was at school, she was at school. And that was about it. She um, described how difficult she found it adjusting to being a, a parent, which we can all understand, and because it is really difficult at any age adjusting to be a parent, and um, she found it. She she found her baby's sleepless nights and so on very difficult to deal with, and um, gradually she returned to to marijuana use, not any not harder drugs than that, but to regular use of marijuana. And in that first year that she was at school, she was there, but that was all that she was able to do. Um, she wasn't um, emotionally or kind of intellectually available for learning at that time. Um, but she says when she looks back on that time that it was a miracle that she was there at all. That was her achievement, actually getting to school each day was a huge achievement for her. After about a year, she decided that she had to do something about her drug use, that she couldn't be the good mother that she really wanted to be while she was using marijuana so heavily. And she finally went to the school counsellor and with the school counsellor's support she became drug free over a period of time. And as a drug free young woman she then became emotionally and intellectually ready to give schooling another go. So each of these young women had decided to return to school despite having found conventional schooling frustrating and alienating, and each was motivated really by the desire to provide a better future for their children. What did these young women say about their experiences at the School for Teenage Parents? This is what Kate had to say. When I first started, I thought it would be poor little thing. But everyone there, it was the one place where I felt I was okay. I was just like everyone else. It was like a wee bubble. It was good. The childcare staff just loved our children. They were great. It's hard as a young parent doing activities on your own and getting negative looks and comments from other people. 
At the school, you didn't feel like you were abnormal. You didn't feel self-conscious. The group made you feel awesome. The teachers really cared about what I was doing, and they wanted me to really do well. I always felt that we were partners. We were both invested in my learning, and we did it together. When I came to the school, my plans changed. The supermarket wasn't an option anymore. There were bigger and better things to do, and people liked me at school, and they liked me for me, and they loved my daughter. So that's Kate. And this is Andy. I don't know what I'd pictured it to be like. I didn't expect that level of support to come from teachers. I didn't think they'd care so much. You could see and feel that genuine love. That was overwhelming, like, wow, it felt so special. It felt nice to have adults who cared about me in that way. And if we didn't have those relationships with the teachers, and if we didn't feel accepted, it was our feelings of self-worth. None of us were going to achieve anything unless we sorted that out first. We were all safe. We were all secure in our place there. There was such a strong sense of well-being. It was just like a second home. Now let me share what these young women achieved at the School for Teenage Parents. Over time, each of them was supported to experience the really empowering rewards of academic success and to claim, um, in the case of Kate and Andy, really to reclaim their identities as academically able and competent learners. Each was also supported to be the best mother that she could be and to be a confident and well-rounded young woman. Andy attended the school for three and a half years she achieved NCEA Level 1 and 2, she got her driver's licence, and she started a tertiary level diploma. She was awarded the Prize for Academic Excellence, and she gained a prestigious scholarship to complete her studies once she had left the school. Despite her initial reluctance, which I referred to earlier, she actually joined in other cultural activities at the school, such as singing in the choir, which was quite an achievement for her, and playing sports. And um, she also addressed uh, several community organisations on the school's behalf. Her essential personality hadn't really changed. Um, she still got angry at times. She still had big kind of moments of self-doubt and she had to be cajoled to kind of achieve certain, you know, assignments that she had to complete. But through her experience of success at the school, she'd learned to manage those um, kind of angry, self-doubting moments much better than she had bef could before. She'd also become socially more outgoing and she was a committed and responsible parent. So that was Andy. What about Kate, the failed learner? She also attended school for more than um, three years and she achieved NCEA levels two and three. She also got her driver license and she commenced a tertiary preparatory course while she was at the, still at the school. Uh, she played netball at school. She sang to the in the choir. Um, and during her time at school, as I've already said, she had been supported to overcome her drug addiction and to leave the violent relationship with the young man who was her, father, her daughter's father. While still quiet, she had blossomed from an anxious young girl into a socially mature and more um, assured young woman who was a committed and loving mother. Now, each of these young women had also made lifelong friends while they were at the school. Now, obviously, not all um, of the young women who attend teen parent schools achieve the academic success of Kate and Andy. But I would like to say that in my own work at Karangamai Young Parents College, um, I was constantly surprised, and other teachers at the school were too, at the unrealised abilities of so many of the young women. Abilities which found expression and flourished in a nurturing environment with its many, many personal and social and cultural opportunities. So what was it about 
the school in my study, which had such a transforming effect on the lives of so many of its students. Firstly, the school provided a safe, affirming and nurturing environment built upon loving and respectful relationships with teachers and other members of staff. And that really was the foundation of, of everything at the, at the school. A culture of success was normalised and celebrated at the school in stark contrast with the young women's you know, previous experiences of school failure and alienation at conventional school. So success was expected and it was normalised when you came to the school, that is what you did. Um, and this experience of success, which was um, you know, so new for most of these young women, gave them hope, whereas before they had felt that they had very little kind of hope, very few aspirations for their future, they now felt hopeful for their own futures and for their children's futures. And as you well know, hope is a very powerful um, uh, virtue to, it, it's a very powerful life-changing virtue really. Um, as well as that, the school became a family for the young women, a whānau for the young women and their children. It was their safe haven. It was like a second home. It was a place where being a teenage parent was affirmed and celebrated and supported and normalised. And when I say celebrated, as you can probably imagine, teenage parents, when they have their babies, it is not normally regarded as a cause for celebration in wider society. In fact, it is you know, often the reverse, very unlike the way we celebrate most people's, the birth of most people babies. Um, but at the school when babies were born this was celebrated and so this was a place where being a teenage parent was affirmed and this was really important for these young women because they were parents and in common with all new parents, young, old, um, they needed the enveloping support of a nurturing whānau, a nurturing family to enable them to blossom and grow in this new identity. Now, as well as these social, cultural um, aspects of the school, the school also was a school. And it offered uh, effective teaching and learning interactions. So the young women and the teachers talked about the learning partnerships between teachers and students, about the importance of choice, about being treated like an adult, about the teacher's uh, commitment to their academic and personal success, their belief that these young women could succeed, about their understanding of the young women's individual learning needs, about the use of one-to-one -one and small group instruction, and about the celebration of achievements. The school also didn't just offer the, this academic support. As I said earlier, it offered holistic wraparound support for these young people. So there was a, um, an on-site quality early childhood um, service for the children of the young parents. There was transport to and from the school, there was food, and there was social support with the variety of personal issues that these young people needed support with. And all of this contributed to their experience of well-being. And the school also offered a full and enriching non-academic program as well, focusing on such things as physical health, sports and dance and fitness and healthy eating, um, cultural and creative activities, things like uh, taha Māori, um, performing arts and crafts. Uh, there were regular activities with the children, outings with the children and um, activities with the children, including uh, very importantly, and I think this is characteristic of most of the teen parent schools in New Zealand, the encouragement of daily reading to your children. And you will have noticed in the first slide that I showed you of a young parent with two children that they were sharing a book together. Um, there were practical life skills, such as cooking, and um, also careers advice, work placements, and so on. Uh, and finally, I'd like to say that the school was especially effective because 
the young women and children were immersed in this intimate learning environment on a daily basis for a period of often three or more years. And you can imagine that for the children, this was their first three years, those first three formative years of a child's life, um, was spent here in this very enveloping, supportive um, environment. And um, this um, intense daily long-term exposure really served to normalise the school culture for these young people, even though in many cases it was so different from the context of their own homes, their relationships, and certainly from the context of the wider society in which they were living. So um, this, I would say, argue is one of the keys to the transformative effect of the school on the lives of, of um, its young people. So let's get back to Andy and Kate again and look at what their, what their achievements are today, what they're doing today. Andy's now in her late 20s. She's completed her tertiary qualification and she works full-time in the um, field of information technology. She's the first person in her family to have gained any school qualifications at all. She and the father of her child are now married and they have purchased their own home, which I think is an amazing achievement for any young couple in New Zealand. Um, and that's what they've managed to do. When I asked her about the influence of the school on her life, um, she said that it had opened her awareness to opportunities that she had never imagined would be available to her. It had showed her that she could set and achieve goals. It had instilled in her a work ethic. And um, I think it's, it's really interesting if you think about um, the, the daily life of young people attending teen parent schools. I'll tell you, for example, about Karangamai. Um, Karangamai is, is um, based in Kaipoi, but many of its students, although some of the students come from the Waimakariri district, many of its students come from Christchurch. So every day, uh, one or two minibuses goes out into Christchurch and collects um, parents and children. The first pickup might be quarter to eight in the morning. Now, if you imagine yourself as a young parent with a child, you've got to be ready, up, ready, dressed, breakfasted, food for your children for the day, organised for school by quarter to eight in the morning. Now that is quite a feat. Some of those young women used to also vacuum the house, do the washing, do the dishes before they left home. And then some of them would not get home before five o'clock at night, and this was often five days a week. So I used to say to the young women at Karangamai that they were the kind of queens of um, personal management. They developed all these incredible uh, skills because of their experience at, at the school. Um, and uh, Andy talked about uh, the work ethic that she um, developed while she was at the school, and she talked about her unexpected love of learning. And of course she said that it had increased her confidence and her self-belief. She said, I still go, wow, I did finish NCA level one and two, and it feels a bit surreal looking back on it and getting the scholarship. It feels so nice, because it was the first time in my life that I felt like I was achieving anything. At the time, I would have been a bit humble, but now I'm like, yoo-hoo, look at me. <laughs> so that was Andy. Um, and Kate also has completed her tertiary qualification. She's completed a degree, and she's working full-time in the field of education. She has no contact with the violent young man who was the father of her daughter, and after a long period of um, being on her own, she is now in a committed and loving relationship. And I was really interested when I interviewed her because she told me, you know, Kate is a quiet person. And she told me that after the September and um, February earthquakes, she visited all of her neighbours, most of whom were elderly, and she went and visited them all to see if they were okay. So that's Kate. And um, she said, I feel good about who I am today. I've changed a lot, but in a good way. I'm quite happy with my achievements. 
It's good to have hard work rewarded and be on the right track. Now, I'd like to share one more example of um, the influence of the school on another student, the student who's a bit different from Andy and Kate, and this student is called Zena. Zena came from a large family, and she was brought up in a, really in a conflict-ridden kind of household, and her parents eventually separated. And um, her, her parents really struggled to meet the children's um, material and emotional needs. And Zena had a lot of difficulties at school. She re also, she really struggled to learn to read and write, and she struggled all the way through primary school. And um, she had really limited literacy when she enrolled at um, the teen parents' school at um, the age of 14 as a very young first-time mother. She still had quite li limited literacy skills. She had recently been expelled from her school, uh, not because of her difficulties with literacy, not directly because of her difficulties with literacy, but because of her anger and her alienation, really, and her frustration. Unlike Kate and Andy, Zena continued to struggle academically um, throughout her period at the Teen Parents School. She was not an academic student, um, but she really preferred the hands-on kind of practical aspects of the environment there. So she loved working in the school veggie garden, she loved cooking, and she was a really popular um, young woman with other um, students at the school because she was, although she was very young, she was a fantastic mum and she was a very kind of candid and open and, and friendly young woman. So everyone loved her. And um, knowing of the struggle that she had with reading, I was very touched when I interviewed her to learn that she'd, after leaving the school, she had joined the local library and she took her little boy regularly um, to the library to withdraw books and she even admitted that she herself had become a reader for pleasure, something that she had never imagined would happen. She attributed this to the school's emphasis on the importance of reading to your children and this was something that she'd never experienced as a child herself. Um, she was so committed to her son's education that when she uh, felt that the primary school wasn't doing its job and giving him homework, she prepared homework sheets for him. I'm not sure how he felt about that. Uh, but she would make up homework sheets for him and um, she obviously wasn't familiar with the recent research about the value of homework for primary school students. But anyway, that was her commitment to her son's education because of her own negative experience of failure at primary school. When I asked these young women and the other young women in my study um, to reflect on the influence on their lives of their experience at the school for teenage parents, they talked about, about a variety of things. They talked about their growth and confidence. Interestingly, they talked about the fact that they had become more inclusive and less judgmental to other people. And I thought that that was really interesting. They, they described the community at the teen parent school that they attended as inclusive and diverse and they felt that that had really assisted them to develop tolerance themselves. They talked about the social benefits of long-term friendships made at the school and they talked about the positive transformation of the, their identities as learners and of their understanding of the importance of education for their children and of their increased opportunities and their self-belief and the impact of these on their life aspirations. And they talked about their increased capacity to cope with life's challenges, which I also thought was very interesting. So because they were supported and nurtured and experienced success in the school environment, this developed their resilience to be able to better cope with challenges after they left school. And of course they talked about the social and educational benefits for their children as well. So that's the school. 
Now, I'd like to talk a little bit more about what these young women said about becoming parents in their teens. Interestingly, they all said that when they found out that they were pregnant, they were shocked. That was the term that they all used. They were shocked to discover that they were pregnant. However, regardless of how young they were, and, and several of them, several of the young women in my study were 14 when they became parents. They ranged actually from 14 up to the oldest was 19. Um, they all said that this was a turning point in their lives and aspirations. It prompted them to think about their own and their child's future well-being. And in some cases to make significant life changes, including, as we've already said, returning to school. This despite almost all of them having dropped out of school either before or after becoming pregnant. For several of these young women, the lifestyle changes they made were literally life-saving. For one, it meant extracting herself from a gang. For several, it meant stopping drug-taking. And for several, it meant ex extricating themselves from violent relationships. And for these young women, their pregnancies really could be seen as saving their lives. When I asked Andy what she thought um, she would have been doing if she hadn't become pregnant at 16, she said, I think I would have been a complete write-off. I really would have been, because of the people that I knew and the things I did. And this is what Kate said. She said, I feel good about who I am today. I've changed a lot, but in a good way. I think what I've done is a lot better than what I would have done if I didn't have my daughter. I think that would have been a tragedy. I'd like to share a conversation that took place between Zena and her partner Simon about the effects on their lives and identities of becoming parents in their early teens. This couple had begun their parenting journey at the tender age of 14 and 15, respectively, and they were still together after 10 years. Simon has had his own business, very successful business, since he's 20, and the, they are a, a hard-working couple, and they're really focused on achieving their life goals. And this is what they said. Simon... It focused me a lot. I laughed when he said that because he was 15 at the time. He said, before I was just drifting around and doing not much. Um, whatever I felt like doing at the time, but it focused me a lot. I wouldn't change anything. By now, I could still not be doing anything. And Zena, yeah, well, that's what I feel too because I was really naughty and never home and drinking and doing stupid stuff, and I could still be doing that now. Simon, yeah, people we know who don't have kids are still doing that now and getting into mischief and stuff like that. Zena, you want to tell them to wake up. Yeah, you think more responsibly. Simon, you still have plenty of fun. I don't think you miss out on too much. Zena, I just think being a young mum doesn't stop you from doing what you want to do. Sometimes, being a young mum, you can do more than if you weren't a young mum. This construction of their identities as responsible young adults whose lives have been positively transformed as a result of becoming young parents is common not only to the young parents in my study, but to many young parents, many young parents who've participated in other research, many young parents. Um, this strongly refutes the negative um, perception that we have about the outcomes of teenage parenthood. Um, as you probably know, there are a lot of um, studies which indicate that teenage parents have there are long-term um, health, educational, social, economic negative consequences. Um, but this was not the case in, in, uh, for the young people in, in my study. And, um, you know, really I would argue that their experience of becoming parents in their teens was an opportunity rather than a problem. Provided there's 
adequate support around them. So what are the implications of these findings for our society? While I've argued that teenage parenting can be li a life-changing opportunity for young people, it's still obviously really important to acknowledge the challenges and the loneliness experienced by many teenage and older mums and dads in a society which appears to place less value on the identity of parenthood, motherhood, than on that of career and income earning. Because of the enormous um, social and demographic changes that have occurred in our society in the last few decades, um, which have involved women, of course, entering, uh, continuing with their education, entering into the workforce in, in every sphere of human endeavour, um, one of the sort of um, unexpected side effects of that is that uh, for new families, there is often not um, much familial support, much family or neighbourly support available because so many women who are perhaps grandmothers, aunties, neighbours, are in work, in work themselves, in full-time work and don't have the same, um, they're not as available as in the past to support um, young families. So this support which families need has to come from often from community um, agencies rather than from families as it did in the past. And um, this is, you know, these are some of the reasons why the work of teen parent schools is so important and so potentially life-changing. Um, as you've seen, many young parents who attend these schools receive the family support that may not otherwise be av readily available to them. And of course, this is a great protection for them and for their children. Many of the young parents who attend teen parent schools um, become independent of welfare support as well. This is a big concern in our society that, um, oh, those teenage parents are all welfare bludgers, they're all beneficiaries, they're on the benefit, they get pregnant to get on the benefit, um, which I think um, you would find that a lot of young people would strongly refute. And in fact, um, what I discovered in my work with teenage parents was that um, those who were um, on the domestic purposes benefit, the single young women who received the domestic purposes benefit, saw this as a temporary stopgap measure and couldn't wait to become independent financially independent. Um, so attending a teen parent school, of course, supports these young people to become independent of welfare support because of their increased capacity to become self-supporting and to have their own careers. Um, so I would argue that really the economic costs of running these schools is far outweighed by the long-term social, health, educational and economic benefits to the young people themselves, to their children, because of course there are intergenerational benefits, and to society at large. I'd like to end um, my presentation by arguing for the capacity of a humane and caring society to embrace and celebrate diverse family structures in this case, families headed by teenage parents. Rather than stigmatisation and disapproval, the provision of loving support is surely a more compassionate and effective response to society's widespread concern about teenage parents. After all, every human being needs loving support. Every human being needs affirmation in order to thrive and develop to her or his full potential. And young and vulnerable families particularly need and warrant such support. There's a really beautiful Māori whakatauki or proverb which goes like this, ka whangaia, ka tūpū, ka puawai. That which is nurtured blossoms and grows. Thank you.
and I 